Welcome. Um, welcome to tonight's panel. And um, we have one more um, Outliers and Outlaws storyteller panel coming up in January. Um, this will be former and current UO faculty and students reflecting on their efforts to create community and fight discrimination here on campus. Um, so that'll be our last one for this exhibit. And it's been an incredible project. Um, I've been sort of in the on the back end of this. It was done by Lauren Willis and Elizabeth White, our exhibit designer and our curator of academic programs with our wonderful curators who are here tonight. Um, and for us at the museum, really redefining what cultural history means. This is not what typically our audiences expect. And we love that we're being able to push those boundaries and really educate people on some new fields. So thank you, Julie and Linda, for all that you've done. Thank you. Well, I'm Ann Craig. I'm the associate director here at the museum, and mostly I answer emails and find budget sheets. And <laughs> once in a while, I get to do this fun stuff. So thanks for letting me be here tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce Beatrice Dorn, and um, she's going to give you an introduction, and then our other panelists will introduce themselves if you don't already know them. Um, so we're joined this evening by Beatrice Dorn, Director Emerit of the Nonprofit Clinic and a former instructor at the University of Oregon School of Law. Before coming to Eugene, Beatrice ran the legal department for Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, which I think you're going to talk a little bit about. Um, and this organization has a mission to achieve full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexual, transgender people, and everyone living with HIV through impact litigation, education, and public policy work. Ooh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Our panelists this evening include two narrators from Eugene Lesbian Oral History Project, Janet Anderson and Martha Pitts. And we are also joined tonight by Amy Speckle. Thank you all for being here. They're here to share their reflections on marriage equality and what same-sex marriage means for them and their relationships. So please join me in welcoming the panel tonight. Okay. Um, since this, uh, I don't usually do this kind of thing, but since this whole project is a lot about then and now, I, um, do I push this that way? This one? I sketch. Oh, it's back on me. That's <laughs> I'm here to be the now. That's my then. <laughs> I love it. That was, that was when I uh that's the first informal headshot when I started my job as legal director at Lambda um in, in 1993. Um and I was actually 35 in that picture. <laughs> anyway, take that off now. <laughs> um, um, anyway, since I just took you back to 1993, um, when I started at Lambda, in 19, well, I, I should start this by saying I'm going to give you a little how we got here in a nutshell, um, a bit focused on the legal battles because I was part of those. Um, in 1993, when I became legal director of Lambda, um, the, since you're all looking at it, I'll tell you those are three big headlines in the New York Times by complete coincidence, they're each a June 27th. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a total coincidence in that the Supreme Court has its last week of decisions in the third week of June, but it is kind of funny that it always was the 27th. Um, and I will talk a little bit about each one of those cases, but that's a little picture of the headlines. Um, so in 1993, when I started, the decision of whether or not to pursue marriage rights was, was really a hot one. It was um, uh, not... Um, there was no consensus among the legal groups at the time, um, and uh, I, I have to say I felt compelled for us to pursue marriage rights because of the uh, version of what you just heard our our mission was, although I have to say at that time it didn't include, uh, it, at that time it was lesbians and good men is what, what was in the tagline, but um, it's been long since then, but I, I really didn't see how we could uh, advance the mission of full equality for lesbians, gay men, uh, without pursuing marriage rights. I thought the idea that we would somehow 
restructure the system so that all these benefits would not be conferred by a marriage was not viable and that as the legal director, that's what I had to do. I'm no lover of marriage. I'm a, a born and bred feminist and I wasn't too thrilled about it, but I felt that's what we had to do. Um, and so we did. Um, I'm now gonna take you back briefly as far as 1975 or actually 1973, um, which was um, when these two men, um, Anthony Sullivan and Richard Adams, uh, heard that as, happen as, as has, has happened a few times in Boulder, Colorado, a county clerk decided to take the law into her own hands and to start issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Um, this couple needed immigration status for Anthony Sullivan very, very badly, and they heard about this and they went and they got married. Um, and after that, they filed a petition for uh, a green card for Anthony Sullivan because he had not married an American citizen. Um, and they, the initial, yeah, that's right, yes. Um, the initial response to their petition, this is coming from the Department of Justice. It's in 1975. And perhaps you can read it from here. The decision was, you have failed to establish that a bona fide mar marital relationship can exist between two facts. <laughs> so, so that's 1975. Um, 10 years later in 1985, <laughs> Um, what had been going on was that the Supreme Court was, in the context of uh, some cases concerning contraception, was 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 writing some actually really beautiful law uh, about um, the right to privacy in the most intimate decisions that people make in their bedroom or about their private intimate lives. And uh, there, the two cases that were most important about this concerned. Um, the right, uh, the concern of prohibition on the sale of contraception at all. Uh, and then the second case concerned um, a law that only allowed the sale of contraception to married people. So there was mm -hmm. particularly good language in these cases about the right to privacy conferring a sort of intimate space where the government did not have any, any kind of a reason to, to intrude between consenting adults. Um, so, uh, at that point, um, the movement basically decided to bring a case uh, about that same issue, about consenting adults and their intimate behavior concerning what were then called sodomy laws, laws that made same-sex consensual sexual behavior illegal. Um, in 1985, uh, the Supreme Court decided a case called Bowers versus Hardwick. Um, and while the case was was written with these same concepts that I just described to you concerning the protection of an intimate space. The court chose instead to write a really ugly, ugly opinion. First of all, first off, characterizing what the case was about as an effort to extend the constitution to give a right to homosexual sodomy. That's the term that they repeatedly used in the decision. Um, and at one point, um, I, I think I have a blow up of that here too. Um, I, I mean, if you're not in the habit of reading Supreme Court opinions, maybe this doesn't seem so unusual, but it's really unusual for them to be quite this vicious. Um, and they, they basically, what they're basically saying in the highlighted part, they use the term um, that our argument was at best facetious, um, referring to the argument that these, these, this right to intimate, to a, to a protected space, um, exist in the Constitution and should extend to this kind of uh, of conduct. Um, so I'm telling you all that to say that's where we were in 1985. That's where we were in 1975. That's where we were in 1985. Um, by the way, just as a, a side piece, um, in uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, the 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 ruling on the right um, is the 2003 reversal of Bowers versus Hardwick, which was an extremely important stepping stone to any effort to win marriage equality. There just is no way that that could have happened without this case happening. Um, 
a case that uh, um, took just took took tremendous um, strategy and good luck to set up. So, um, so from there, in the early 1990s, there was some indication from some things that were going on in Hawaii that the Hawaii Supreme Court might grant the right to marriage. Um, as a as a response to that, if it hadn't happened, as a response to the possibility that it might happen, Congress passed something that we refer to as DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. So this was an act that said that no matter what any state says about who can marry in their state, for federal purposes, a marriage shall only be between one man and one woman, I think is what it said exactly. Um, so there, there was no state in which anyone could get married at this point. In fact, that didn't happen for 10 years. Uh, it, it happened in 2004 in Massachusetts first, um, but Congress was worried about it um, and saw fit to do that. Um, some of you might recall, because in, in 2008, Oregon uh, created a domestic partnership. It, they didn't actually call it marriage, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here participated in this, that it, it conferred all the state rights of marriage, which was all it could confer, still not still existing. Um, but some of you might remember the kind of weird um, after after marriage was started to take on that you could go to Massachusetts to get married, you could get a domestic partnership here. Some of you might remember the kind of weird regime that we lived under for a while, right, where you were married for state purposes, but you weren't married for federal purposes. Folks probably remember you had to do that whole mm -hmm. two step with your tax returns, right? Mm -hmm. You had to create a federal tax return as though you were married and then import that into your Oregon tax return and then go back and do a federal tax return because you weren't really married and, and all that kind of thing. So we existed under that regime um, for a while. And then along came Edie Windsor, who um, was married to her long, long, long-term spouse who died. Um, and she wanted her uh, inheritance to be treated the same way that inheritance for federal tax purposes, she wanted her inheritance to be treated the same way as it would be if she was in a different sex marriage. Um, and that, that was the Windsor case. That's the case on the left. That's a picture of Edie Windsor. Um, and and the, so, so just to be clear, that was a huge breakthrough case when we won that. But that case did not establish the right to get married if you were in a same-sex sex couple. What it took aim at was this was what I referred to as DOMA. So what it what it said was, the Constitution doesn't allow you to treat some marriages different than other marriages, and that we want. And the idea at that point was, well, we've we've broke, we've got the sort of chink in the wall is now down because you can go to these different states and get married, and now the the you're mar you're fully married. However. The same way that Congress felt that it had to preempt same-sex marriages, um, many states had passed what we were referring to as state DOMA. So they had laws that said, if you uh, uh, were married in a state other than this state, you we will only recognize your marriage if you could have been married in this state. So you can't go off to Massachusetts and get married and come back to Ohio. You, because in Ohio didn't confer that right to marry. So in 2015, we brought a case that took aim at those statutes. Now, it was pretty clear we would win the part about that you can't treat different marriages differently under the Constitution because we had already won that in 2013. They had already said that the, the Constitution, that equal protection doesn't allow that kind of differentiation. Um, so it was very important that the case take that on and our kind of hedging our bets, sort of worst, not worst case scenario, but I, I don't know how to put it in terms of case scenario, but what, what we thought was, it's highly unlikely that the Supreme Court is gonna actually say that states have to let us get married. But if they say every state has to recognize marriages, at that point, we had marriage in I think 18 states. It, it changed so fast, it's hard to say what at what point, but. The idea was you could get married. You, if you couldn't get married in your state, such as Ohio, which is where Obergefell, the name plaintiff in that case, lived, you could go to Wisconsin and get married and then come home to Ohio and your marriage would be recognized. It wasn't great because 
some people live in parts of the country where you have to really go pretty far. And if you didn't have the resources or the time off from work or whatever to go get married, you, you, it, it wasn't perfect. But it seemed better than not having marriage at all. Um, as it turned out, though, the part of the case that said not only must you treat marriage as the same, but equal protection actually requires you to not discriminate in who you let get married, um, that part was a victory as well. And there, for as you know, and that's the equal dignity headline in the middle there. Um, and it's really that moment in 2015 that the tables were made <clears throat> completely even. Um, we hope that that's the final chapter in this struggle. The Supreme Court uh, has showed its propensity to switch things up, but it's hard to imagine that they can do that with this issue, but we have to hope. So that's really my part. I, I think it's, I, I have to say that personally, I encounter a lot of people who feel like this happened really quickly. Um, and <laughs> I, one of the reasons why I like to, to, to give this kind of a presentation is so that folks understand there was really a lot of fast action in the, you know, 20, I don't know, 12 to 2015 period, things seem to be happening very quickly. Um, but it really didn't happen that quickly. It really was a long, um, a long battle. And I mean, it, it's such an interesting that I, I've just given you this little nutshell. Um, there were so many interesting twists and turns to this. Um, and I have to say that there's a ton of strategy that went into all of this. Uh, and I don't say this in any way to give myself any credit. I, I just like basically fed and watered a, a, a bunch of attorneys who had brilliant ideas about this kind of stuff. And it was really four legal groups that did amazing strategic work to, to make this happen. Every step of the way was all totally strategized. So it was uh, my complete honor to be a part of it at all. So. That's my part of this. <laughs> now, now our panelists are going to introduce themselves, and then I'm going to ask them a couple questions. Is the microphone Can you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. Test. Can you hear it? <clears throat> Very good. So, yeah. are there, so are there are, are there some of our personal slides? That we're yeah. only used in this part of the introduction. Thank you. That's Janet. That's Janet. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, okay. This is me. Uh, my name is Martha Pitts. Um, and uh, the person who is with me in these pictures is my wife, uh, Tracy Lampman. She is not here. She's in California tonight. She really wanted to be here. Uh, we like talking about getting married. We like getting married. We did so several times. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, I, I'm fr originally from Tennessee. I grew up in a small farm town in Tennessee. My father was a farmer and my mom was a stay-at-home mom from a very traditional, very Southern Baptist family. Uh, I moved to Indiana to go to college. Uh, I moved to, to Oregon uh, with my then partner for, gra for uh, her graduate school. Uh, I got a job working at the University of Oregon. I served as the director of admission and assistant vice president for enrollment at the University of Oregon. I was there from uh, 1986, uh, 1987 to 2007. Uh, and when I left, I did some consulting and then I worked for the college board for 15 years and I retired last November. And I love being retired. I highly recommend it. Um, uh, Tracy and I met here at the University of Oregon. Uh, we uh, started dating in 1997 uh, and we got married for the first time. And I'll talk about marriage in a very non-legal way uh, because uh, most of the, our, our, our marriages were not legal. Uh, but we, we, uh, we, the first picture is when we first started dating that uh, and uh, went, uh, we're at the coast for the weekend. And then the picture, we got married the first time at the coast. We got married in Yahats. Uh, it was a very small ceremony. We had about 15 people uh, and we decided to get married because we wanted uh, to celebrate our, our relationship. We wanted to cement that. It had a uh, spiritual meaning for us. We had a pastor from our church who was there. 
uh, and, and performed the ceremony. It was an important part of that for us uh, and a very small number of, uh, of friends and family uh, and then a blowout party about two weeks after that to celebrate. But we wanted the wedding to be just for us. And that was in 1999. Uh, and so uh, that was uh, there was nothing legal about it. We knew that. Uh, and we really didn't care for us. It was 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 really quite important. So you can go on to the next slide. The um, the next slide is uh, the, 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 the picture on the left is. The, I think it was 2002, forgive me if I get the dates wrong, when the city of Eugene started a registry. Uh, and so we were couple number 10, uh, and that is us having our ceremony. Uh, and I think Tracy still chagrined that I wore that that particular sports coat to, the, to that, <laughs> that, that event. But, uh, but that was from 2002. We got, we got uh, a certificate, it still hangs in our house. Uh, and it was on uh, Feb February 14th, uh, and that was our next attempt. It, there was, again, uh, it didn't convey any legal status to our marriage, but it did, uh, it, it was important to us, and it was a nice celebration, and, and a really, I think, um, powerful thing for the city of Eugene to recognize uh, those, those of us who wanted to, to be registered. Uh, and then next was our 2000 and eight, no, let's see, this was 2000, no, it was 99, 2002, 2004. 2004 is the next one. This was when Multnomah County started issuing marriage licenses to <laughs> same-sex couples. And so you could go up there, you could get married there, you could get us, we got our marriage certificate and, and came back and we had planned a small ceremony at our house uh, and we were going to, to get married at our house. Uh, and then we started hearing uh, on, on that was going to be on Monday. And on Friday, we started hearing rumors that they were going to um, shut down. They were going to stop uh, accepting these and, and letting people file them. And so uh, we, we called Dave Fidanke, who was a friend of ours. We called Dave and said, Dave, what do we do? He said, I would get married right away. So we called this our shotgun wedding uh, <laughs> because the next day we uh, we we called uh, the pastor, this one of our pastors at our church and said, we need to get married today uh, and it was her she had just been ordained it was her first wedding ever uh, and she said I always hoped that the first wedding that I performed would last forever and I feel like that that's a really good good choice with you guys and so uh, we both have on our work clothes we grabbed a bottle of champagne a couple of flowers uh, and the pastor's daughter and the secretary from the church were our uh, witnesses, along with Jen Bills, for any of you who know Jen. So that was our 2004 Multnomah County wedding. As you know, those were uh, those were declared illegal. We went, I'm sure others of you went through the same trauma that we did. We were disappointed. We were hurt. We were angry. We walked in the streets and protested. And then we tried to figure out what our status was because we were not annulled. We were not divorced. Uh, we decided that we were illegally married, which made us love bandits. And so that is our uh, that is our love bandit shotgun wedding. Uh, and so if you want to go into the next slide, um, there is one wedding that is missing, and that is when the or what not exactly a wedding, but when the when the state started to have domestic partnerships, uh, we did register and as as domestic partners in the state. Unfortunately, I was out of town. Uh, I was in New York on business uh, that weekend. And so I had to go through the snow, uh, sign and have paperwork notarized and then FedEx back so that Tracy uh, could go and file our paperwork with our friends and make sure that we didn't miss any deadlines. Uh, but this picture is from our 2014 wedding when it was finally legal. We made the decision. Lots of people made decisions for lots of different reasons about how to go about this if they wanted to get married. Uh, we made the decision to wait until it was legal in Oregon for us to get married. Uh, we did not go to Massachusetts or Washington or Canada to get married because we wanted to get married in our church, our spiritual family in Eugene. We go to First Congregational Church in Eugene, which has been an open and affirming church since 1997. Uh, and we found that we felt like that was such a supportive group when when there were uh, when, in 2014, before uh, they decided not to put a marriage issue on the ballot. Uh, our church was canvassing for people to sign petitions to put this on the ballot. 
Um, and we felt like we had such a great number of friends and family uh, and, and such support in our congregation that we wanted to get married in our church by a pastor. And this was on the 15th anniversary of our first wedding. So it was 15 years. And when people do talk about it going fast. And quite honestly, even for me, I feel like it went very quickly because it. I, I really didn't think at this point in my life, I'm 63 now, and I did not think at 63 I would have had the uh, legal right to get married. So it, it while it was, we, we laugh about getting married five times, uh, it was it was an important journey, uh, and it's been kind of nice not to have to think about it for the last uh, almost ten years now. And um, and that's us in front of the the picture um, that is back there uh, of our wedding that was included in the museum here. So uh, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And somebody stopped me at the at the exhibit opening and said, "Oh wow, are you two still together?" They saw us losing. Oh, that's your picture. It's like, are you still together? And I said, "Yes." And they're like, "Well, that must be really hard." And I was like, "No, it's actually kind of fun. We do really well." So that's our uh, marriage story. <laughs> My name is Janet Anderson, and um, uh, my uh, partner is Evelyn. My wife, partner, spouse, uh, person uh, that I love is Evelyn Anderton. I want to acknowledge and let you know that Evelyn uh, died uh, September 2nd. And um, so should I burst into tears or choke up, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. But that's what happens when you grieve. So mm -hmm. here I am, <laughs> hoping that that won't happen. But if it does, don't worry about me. Um, now, we were not married quite so many times as you were. <laughs> but we did always wonder, what anniversary should we celebrate? <laughs> you know, should we, should we celebrate the day that we met, which was March 8th, International Women's Day in 1986? Or should we celebrate our first date? when I asked Evelyn to go to the Slug Queen uh, party, um, on uh, August 9th, 1986? Or how about when we moved in together, which was in September of 1987? Now, you notice that there was a year between when we met and when we moved in, which is not the lesbian norm, <laughs> you know, which is, hi, how are you? Let's go to bed and move in together. Um, but what Evelyn, how she was so smart was she said, I don't want to move in together until we've done counseling. So we went to a counselor for a year before we moved in together. That's how smart she was <laughs> and why I loved her. Um, so, or how about February 4th, 2008, when we got domestically partnered um, or August 30th, 2014, when we got married. So it's, you know, how, how do you count and how do you figure out what there are the parts of your um, relationship to celebrate? Um, in talking about gay marriage, you know, I, it's sort of depending on the audience. And I think most of you here, a lot of you here are in my generation and know all of these stories, but, you know, it really has to do with being in the closet and how far we've come from uh, 1972 when I came out uh, to today when I can introduce or, or I used to introduce everyone as my wife. And um, it's it's such a long road between those two things, and I want to thank Beatrice for walking that road for us and make and opening up the gates. Um, <laughs> when I got to Eugene in 1978 to go to graduate school, um, I was in sports medicine in the physical education department at the University of Oregon. Now the um, what people think about women in physical education is that we're all lesbians. <laughs> now that's not exactly true, <laughs> but it's somewhat true. <laughs> um, so I got, I, I got my degree as an athletic trainer and I got a job at Lane Community College. And there were more than one lesbians in the women's department at Lane Community College in physical education, but we never talked about it. Mm -hmm. We never referred to it. We were so in the closet. I mean, it was just incredible how in the closet you are um, in certain situations. So when I met and fell in love with Evelyn in 1986, I was not about to be in the closet anymore. And so within a year, I was out. I left Lane Community College and um, I was 
I was taking uh, uh, people to the USSR on uh, Women's Journeys for Peace to break down barriers. So anyway, um, so we got a job as the co-directors of Women's Space. And from that time on, I was not ever closeted in my jobs. Now, it was a little different with my parents. <laughs> um, my mom knew. I mean, she knew from the time, from 1972, she knew. Um, but um, by 1986, she was really worried about me because I hadn't found the love of my life. And she wanted that to happen for me. And so when I found Evelyn, she was so happy. She was so happy. And um, as a matter of fact, it, eventually she would introduce her to her friends as this is, um, this is my other daughter. Um, but she told me not to tell dad, <laughs> you know, because it would kill him. <laughs> and so um, we never told my father, we never used the L word in front of my, front of my father, but <clears throat> Evelyn and I wanted to let them know how, that, that we were committed to one another. And so what we did is we sat them down formally after dinner one night and we showed them our wills that we had rewritten and made each other beneficiaries of our wills. I mean, we had to have something legal, mm -hmm. something on paper that illustrated who we were because we couldn't get married, we couldn't get domestic partnered. But so despite the fact that my dad never, um, we did never say lesbian in front of him, he really, he and Evelyn got along just great. So, you know, they would go, uh, we'd be in Portland visiting them and they'd go off to the family room to watch golf on TV. <laughs> and my mom and I would be doing something else and then we'd uh, put our nose around the corner in the family room and there would be Evelyn lying on the couch asleep and my dad in his chair asleep. <laughs> um, okay. So gay marriage, um, when it was legal, we, we of course got domestically partnered. Um, and as soon as gay marriage was announced in Oregon, which was in the spring of 2014, um, we decided we had to get married. And our two best couple of friends are, are here and they both got married the same summer. And you got married the same summer? Yeah, we all we all got married the same summer. There were so many lesbian weddings to go good to. Good for the economy. It was good for the economy. <laughs> it was so good for the economy. And now Marilyn and Kay, uh, it was a very different style. They got married in their backyard. There were 30 people there. It was very intimate. Jan and Penny got married in Portland in a hospitality suite. It was very small, a dozen people. It was very intimate, the most important people. But we decided we wanted to have a party. <laughs> okay, so, all right. Um, um, yeah, there we go. Um, we got married at First Christian Church. It was also an open and affirming congregation. Um, and, um, but we, it was the First Christian Church, the big white one with the columns and town, um, but they don't have any place for a reception. So we got the Lake Community College downtown center, which is about four blocks away, uh, to have a reception. And um, how do you get from here to there? <laughs> so we hired the one more time marching band, uh, and we gave everybody purple pom poms, and we marched down the street for the four blocks to the to the wedding reception. Um, our our dog cricket was the ring bearer <laughs> because some people will know this. We, she was in the back with um, Evelyn's sister, and when we needed the rings, we'd say, "Cricket, come on!" And she would ring around the <laughs> Okay, let's have the next picture. So, so there we are, marching down the street. Um, so my 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 friend Steve, who is as straight as straight can be. We know each other from Rotary. We were in the same Rotary class together. Um, he stood up at the next Rotary meeting the next Friday and he said, I never thought that I would be in a gay parade <laughs> with a purple pond. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we did was we hired um, um, Nancy, who is the ballroom dance instructor at Knight Community College, um, to, to teach 
people who were there how to do, you know, the borrowed gas steps that we learned in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. We've all forgotten. So, so we had some ballroom dancing, and she also found the slowest waltz music waltz <laughs> in the history of waltzes. And we learned how to do a waltz because we did the first dance. Oh. Okay, we can do the next. Um, yeah, yeah. No. So that's good enough. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, Thirty-seven years we were together. And nine of them we were married. That looks worth it. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Aidy Steckel. Um, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. And I'm from Eugene. I grew up here. Um, I live in Portland now. I um, I also attended the University of Oregon. I did my undergraduate degree here in ethnic studies and got a minor in queer studies. Um, and let's see, where to begin? So I was attending the University of Oregon as an undergraduate student during what I kind of referred to as the quick years. Like I was here between 2012 and 2016 when everything was really happening very quickly. And I was not in any way opposed to gay marriage at that time, but I also, it wasn't part of my sense of my future at all. I was um, coming to understand myself as queer and gender non-conforming and a lot of different things. And um, I had a girlfriend at the time who I remember was significantly more invested in the idea of gay marriage than I was. And that was something that we talked about. I, at the time, had a sticker on my computer that um, <laughs> was sort of like a play on the human rights campaign equality sign. And instead of the equality sign, it was a greater than sign. <laughs> <laughs> this is an actually, I think, an amazing organization called Against Equality of all things that um, I think, um, you know, was conceiving of gay marriage as among some assimilationist strategies, right? Like you could think of it alongside um, fighting for access to the military, fighting for um, defense against hate crimes, various legal strategies that people have questioned how much those have actually protected the safety of queer people. And I think that I was, certainly in no way opposed to the movement and also was hoping that it would be part of something that ultimately was like greater than like <laughs> hetero patriarchy, right? Like I didn't wanna just settle for, um, for participation in the systems that were oppressing all of us, I mm -hmm. guess. So um, all that's to say, I never thought I would be married or um, <laughs> speaking on a panel about gay marriage. <laughs> um, but here I am, my wife Anna is in the audience. Um, and so yeah, I graduated from the University of Oregon and I moved to Portland. Um, I was working at a uh, Jewish day school when I met my wife Anna and we, um, we met through that community. Um, and during that time, and I think this played a big role probably in my decision to ultimately get married was I was coming to understand myself as a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. And I saw getting married as also part of, of my way to live a Jewish life, not just, um, I didn't see my marriage as just a marriage. I saw our marriage as a, as a queer Jewish marriage and, um, and so figuring out how to take the framework of a Jewish wedding, which a traditional Jewish wedding cannot be lesbian or queer or anything of the sort, and figuring out how to make that work for us was a really meaningful experience. And ultimately, I think, um, sort of put us on the path of being in a Jewish community that was our own, um, for me, certainly like establishing myself as a Jewish person independent of my parents 
um, kind of like that, that next life cycle phase was really important for me. Um, so we, yeah, we met in 2017 and we were together for five years and got married just over a year ago, August 14th of 2022. So that's me. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. No, no, 40 years. Wow, yeah. Already, yeah, she was doing admission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There's some networking happening here. <laughs> <laughs> we all know each other. <laughs> um, that's what they always say. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I think my first question um, has sort of been answered, but I'm going to touch on it anyway, or, or maybe in a little slightly different way, which is, I, I am curious, I mean, ADI, exactly what you say about uh, kind of ambivalence about whether this is really something we should pursue. I, I was curious whether whether there was any of that among our, our panelists and you've exposed it, but I, I wonder, were, were you at the point at which you learned that there was this movement toward actual legal marriage equality? What 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 were each of your thoughts? Like, did, did you wholeheartedly approve? Were you ambivalent about it? Was any of the feminist history uh, uh, tr troubling to you or... Um, so, do tell. I, I was excited. I was thrilled. Uh, and and I, I was, in thinking about this panel, um, it was amazing to me. Janet and I talked a little bit earlier today. And, and, and in our discussion, I felt a tightness in my chest and my throat that I don't think I have felt since I was, uh, since before we were legally married. I know I haven't felt it since then, but but really very early on in our relationship, because I remember worrying that um, that something would happen to me and my and Tracy would not be able to claim my purse, uh, or that there would be issues that were legal issues. I felt I felt exposed and unprotected in a legal in a legal way, even after um, uh, even after we had a domestic partnership. And we both, you know, I worked at the university, then I worked for the college board. Both of them are very progressive in terms of their benefit, were very progressive in terms of their benefits, although PERS was a state program. Uh, and there was, were questions at the time about what, what Tracy would be eligible for if something were to happen to me. Uh, and I, I and I worried about that a lot. I worried about the legal protection. So um, for me, the, the ability to make a, a spiritual statement. It wasn't a religious statement as much as it was for me, a spiritual statement. We made that more than once. And, and that was not the issue for me, but it was the, it was the legal protection that for me was a, a really big deal. Although we did end up having to pay more taxes after we got married. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Are we paying more taxes after we got married? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, she was with mine then too. So. <laughs> um, so the question is, did how did I feel when I first learned that there was a, a marriage movement? Yeah. yeah, I didn't believe it would ever happen. I thought it was a total fantasy, especially I looked this up today when DOMA passed. It didn't just pass. Oh, yeah. It was a slam dunk. Eighty five senators voted yes to, for domestic for uh, domestic. What's it called? DOMA. Doma and 14 said no. And in the house, it was 342 to 67. I mean, you know, they didn't just hate us, you know, <laughs> I mean, th th it was like awful. Um, so I just didn't think it was that would ever happen. I thought it was fancy. I thought it was, you know, ridiculous. Yeah, so I guess what I would add to this is that I just also think that I really grew up in an era where I got to um, <laughs> got to kind of push back. A, you know, I got to sort of ride the privilege of what my queer ancestors had done before me and push back against it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can imagine that if I had been in my 20s, 30s, in the 80s and 90s, I would have had a very different opinion. Mm -hmm. um, having, if I had lived through more direct homophobia and if I had witnessed more things throughout, you know, my life and 
my friends' lives where they didn't have legal protection because they were married, that sort of thing. I just think um, it <laughs> there's there's just no getting around what a massive privilege it is legally um, and what a safety it is that I've gotten to take advantage of the <laughs> thing that I didn't play a big role in making happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I say one, just one yeah. one other thing? Uh, we, uh, you know, certainly age is a, is a part of all of this, and and things have the whole culture has changed. Uh, and I had the great privilege this fall of going to two weddings on the East Coast. My niece Nora got married in Boston and married her partner Vicky, uh, and my uh, one of my dear friends uh, and colleagues' daughter Chloe married her partner Miriam. Uh, and so it is exciting for me to see that there that that that. Um, that that it is still that that people are still making the decision to to get married for whatever reason, and I think every couple has their own reason to get married or not. But uh, it was really uh, it was really funny to have two uh, only two weddings this fall, uh, and both of them uh, were women marrying other women. I have to say that hearing you uh, um, in in composing the questions for this panel, I kind of expected a little bit more pushback, especially from the older contingent. Uh, and and um, what's interesting to me is that, I mean, in some ways, my worst fear has come true, which is that, um, you know, there was there was a time where there was at least, I, I don't think it, it was a winning movement, but there was at least a significant movement that said that instead of pursuing marriage, what we should pursue is to disempower marriage and to no longer attach all those benefits that you were afraid of not having not no longer attach them to marriage and and to basically create a, a religious institution called marriage but in in the civil law to create a completely different way to access all those mm -hmm. benefits um and i guess when i when i say my worst fears come true is that you know uh at the beginning of the fight for marriage we were very committed to not dissing domestic partnership to not sort of elevating marriage over domestic partnership that um mm -hmm. due to some focus groups and how we were doing that fell away um, but it, it has sort of happened like that the whole the, the idea that there would be some other social structure for how to access these benefits has very much fallen off fallen off the face of the map, which I think is was probably inevitable, but it's, it's kind of unfortunate. I can check your mic. I think are you able to hear no, in the back? Challenging. Okay, let me let me just see if I can um, switch this out. Martha, you really I'll try how about if I try yeah. to ask this now? Yeah. Really loud. <laughs> yeah. Um so maybe you you've spoken a little bit about how about about the desire to get married and and how it how it you you in particular, Martha, have talked about how it affected your your legal status. But I guess I wonder like um uh, well, I'll speak for myself and say that, you know, for years I, I was just so angry at the way that marriage was basically a, a the word marriage was a proxy for heterosexuality it was like oh someday you'll grow up and get married which meant someday you'll grow up and be straight um and and i you know because of that i feel like our community developed a, 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 for a time a very very strong sense that you cannot associate uh marriage with stability or important relationships or commitment um and and yet many of my friends who in that time got married would then confess or, or say, wow, I really felt different, even though we for all these years been saying, fuck you, that's no good. Uh, that. <laughs> so I'm curious about that that moment for, for each one of you about um, how the actual status of being married uh, felt different to you in, in the context really of your of your relationship, um, not not of your legal rights. And when we have a mic, you can yeah, it's, or maybe you can shout. <laughs> you want to start on that one? Yeah. Um. Really loud. Well. Yeah. Okay. Um. I think that you should stand up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Yeah, I think that there is a as a as a young. Uh, at least lesbian looking couple. Um, uh, um, yeah, so as a, 
I'm curious to see how this will change over time, I think, because some of it is just, I think that I feel I'm being taken more seriously just as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. And I don't know how much of that has to, has to do with, it feels as much that it's just like this adult thing. Like I've, I've entered the world of adults <laughs> um, and um, so I, I'm curious to see how that will change over time. I don't, I, I don't feel like I have a good answer to this question yet because it was only just over a year ago. So I think TBD on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't really affect our relationships. It reflected, it, um, changed the way people looked at us and it gave us a legitimacy that we didn't have before. And that's stuff that really mattered. Um, I, I remember going away with Jan and Penny. Did this go away? Okay. I remember going away uh, before we got married. Uh, the four of us were just having the best time. And uh, there was this woman that came up to us and said, where are your husbands? <laughs> and we said, we don't have any. <laughs> And and so being married is so, you know, to be able to introduce your spouse as my spouse. It took a long time before I was able to use wife because of this patriarchal, you know, um, associations. It really took. And and so I practiced it. We both did. We said, this is my wife. So, I mean, those were those are ways personally that that we were affected by marriage. Um, and then, of course, there are legal ways. Yep. Here you go. <laughs> I'll use the non-working mic in case it decides to work. Um, we had a we had a part of our of two of our ceremonies of, of, of our our um, uh, our first ceremony and our our last ceremony uh, that was was called a rose ceremony and and it uh, and and basically we came in with one red rose. Uh, and and the, uh, the the idea of it was, in some ways, nothing changed that day that we got married uh, because we walked in with one rose, we exchanged those roses, and we walked out with one rose, and they looked ex exactly the same. Uh, but for each one of those times that we made those commitments to each other, I think it um, you know it, it it wasn't like suddenly the skies opened and the world was different. But there was a deepening and a commitment to each other. And part of that, I think, was in our fight for that equality and for that ability to be legally married and to have that protection uh, and our willingness to fight together and fight as part of our community uh, for the ability to do that. Uh, it deepened our relationship with each other and it deepened our commitment. And each time we went through the whole process of figuring out what we were going to say to each other, uh, and how we were going to approach it in a way that was meaningful to us. So I would say, you know, um, you know, it wasn't the, a, a completely different relationship, but each time for us has had, uh, it has had, other than just being a good story, uh, has had meaning and, and was really important to us and let us recommit and reassert uh, that commitment to each other, which was important for us. I wasn't worried about adulting yet. So that, I mean, I was already, I was already there. So. Well, it's interesting. I've been on kind of a campaign um, for folks to stop using husband and wife. Um, it's, a, it's a campaign I was on a long time ago. Uh, I always felt very supported by, uh, well, I, I, I used to try to urge my straight friends not to get married, you know, because they shouldn't join in institutions that we were excluded from, but, and I'm sure many other people here did too, but you know how far we got with that. Um, and so then when they did get married, I would urge them not to use the term husband and wife, but you know, instead to say partner. And, and when they did, I felt very supported by that. Um, recently, uh, uh, my son like person um, got married and uh, to a woman and um, I've been urging him to use spouse because I, I keep saying to them, like, I want, I don't, I want you to each have the same thing that if she has a husband and you have a wife, that's two really different 
associations. There's different mm -hmm. associations. But it's kind of funny because now it's come full circle. All my gay friends are calling their partners <laughs> husbands and wives. And so it's kind of hard to make the case to straight people that they shouldn't be in the term. So anyway, it's all my stuff. Um, I, I think my other uh, prepared questions have kind of been answered and that maybe we should open it up to the to the audience. We can pass around the non Actually, yeah, actually I have an answer to the to the last question. Go ahead. So the <laughs> want to ask the question? Uh, oh, 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 oh. I, I thought you meant the last question. I just, no, no. I just really asked. The legally, how is being legally uh, married? Why don't you tell us how being legally married? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if, ha if gay marriage had happened before I retired, Avalon would have been covered by my medical benefits at work. And that wasn't the case. Um, we could file federal and uh, state taxes jointly. And I always thought that that had saved us money. It might have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the state benefits, Definitely. which, you know, has just happened, um, I could inherit Evelyn's um, estate without having to go through probate. Um, and in medical issues, which is just really close to my heart now, mm -hmm. um, I could make medical decisions. I could be in the ICU with her, you know, and that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been married. So, I mean, it was huge. So, there we go. Questions? Comments? <laughs> Disclosures? <laughs> well, it's not a question, but the spouse, I mean, this is not a negative burning issue, but it's day to day. Um, Wow. You know, we, we, I mean, in the whole period of keep calm and marry on, you know, mm -hmm. we, uh, my spouse and I got married similar number, however, I, who's counting? Um, we went to Vermont and, we mm -hmm. had a, and then, and then, and then a year later, we had our real wedding. We gave Diane's family a year to get their minds around the idea that we were having a you know wedding celebration and that was long before legal marriage and so forth. So and when we went running up you know in in the night in the rain to Multnomah to do that, you know, we were like saying to each other, like, wait, wait, just like contextualize this for me again. Why are we getting married mm -hmm. and against marriage or you know chattel and all you know and so, spouse, if I don't, if I say spouse, they don't know. If I say wife, I don't want to be out. Yeah, I'm going to be, and it's just this problem of language. And I don't know the thing I work with the most, but it's really problematic. Mm -hmm. so I just wonder, you know, how we all, I mean, if I can say my spouse, she, really quickly, then mm -hmm. that's why, because those are her pronouns. No, I do understand that. I mean, I when people used to say that before, I thought they were being in the closet. I, I, it's that's what I mean about it. it's all sort of turned around. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm Annalise. I am. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for being here. Um, this is really wonderful. I'm a historian here in the history department at UVO, um, and I study women's history and history of gender and sexuality, and I'm currently working on the history of um, lesbian collectives and feminist collectives. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, some of you might have seen me I'm moderating another couple of these wonderful panels. Um, but I just as a quick note in terms of like the history of marriage, believe me, I won't go long, but I could. Um, is, uh, you know, the, actually the, the taxation question, whether you pay more or less, is directly related to the longer history of why the term wife for me, I I I mean I cannot use the term wife because it is a term of coverture when a woman's legal identity was fully eclipsed by her husband's. And the taxation system is built so that in this country, so that um, their so-called marriage penalty when you pay more is only when spouses earn roughly equivalent and higher salaries. It's built to benefit a system in which there is a provider, i.e. a male breadwinner and a dependent female spouse. 
That is what the system actually fully incentivizes and supports. Mm -hmm. So that's why it depends on what your incomes are, if you're paying more or less, and why I also agree. Uh, my own personal history is so much like Martha's, and like many, many, my partner and I have been together for three years and many ceremonies and different kinds. Um, and I agree, Beatrice, I so appreciate your comments of like wanting to not have this um, uh, de radicalized claims to disempower merit, but I think that has been the direction. But I think where I take hold, and I'd love to hear the panelists' thoughts and anyone else's thoughts, is can, okay, so we didn't get rid of the institution, we're strengthening the institution by participating in it, but can we clear the institution? Can we clear marriage? Mm -hmm. Can we, fem you know, make marriage more feminist? Um, and I think that might be happening. Um, and so I'm very interested in thoughts about. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughts? Diane does. <laughs> Which is that you can't get any clearer for marriage than two women because you're both whites, and therefore there is no power imbalance. There is in every heterosexual marriage. You don't have a husband anymore. I, when I got and my partner spouse been together for 35 years, so we had the same kind of history mm -hmm. over and over and over again. You really want me to use that? Yeah. I'm not allowed to talk. I don't think I've ever said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> I took so much pleasure in being out of myself in random places like the grocery store <laughs> checkout line by mm -hmm. saying, to a total stranger, oh, my wife loves that ring. <laughs> Anything like that. Every person who allowed to do that. She couldn't bring herself to do that for the longest. Um, the other thing I was going to throw in is a shout out to the Oregon ACLU. And yes. I, the lawyer, whose name I cannot remember. Who, well, my dear friend David Danke was who got, I didn't get the Multnomah County Commissioner to. The people, the clerk, to start issuing licenses, but they talk to them a lot. <laughs> and then uh, this in 2014, this federal case was the big federal case was 2015, but Oregon came up with it in 2014 because this man and lawyer, whose name I do not recall, decided he wanted to sue while the ACO was going, no, let's not do that, too early, long strategy. And so he sued. In federal court, and then the issue is well, okay, then we're getting on board too. <laughs> and uh, federal judge Michael McShane, yes, granted us that, yes, a year ahead of us. country, and I take the same approach. I'm getting at it, I'm not doing it till it's in court. We got married and then annulled <laughs> mm -hmm. in 2004. We had a big party and celebration with the um, one notice. And my wife's Jewish, and um, we decided to incorporate some elements, one of which was the huppah, which we kind of created one, and people to hold the post, which for those of you who love to imagine. Anybody in this area doesn't know this, but there's a little pan mm -hmm. that we put over the couple that's getting married. And I said to we had a, a Jewish woman who was sort of doing that part of the sermon. What does this actually mean? <laughs> And I don't even know if this is true, but what I was told was it symbolizes the two of you in your home and the four people holding the post are your community and your community supports you being a couple, which I thought was the coolest thing. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I really enjoyed really, 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 really that. Little bits and pieces. I never did find out what was in the class. But <laughs> well, we did it anyway. <laughs> I have time for one more. Okay. I also I could speak to the queering marriage a little bit. I think yeah, we don't... That first yeah. yeah. I have thought of two ideas. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, I think, is one thing that I see more and more is people not necessarily assuming that marriage um necessarily means that you're mm -hmm. monogamous. Um, that's something I think is like more and more, um, in my community anyway, there's a, there's a lot of polyamory 
um, and a lot of people who are creating all kinds of non-traditional family structures, and some of those include marriage, and some of them don't, and some of them include multiple kind, multiple relationships where one person, some people might be married and others might not, and um, so that's one one way I could see just like continuing to think of it as something that you use uh, towards other aims, not something that is like connected to a static identity um, or something that means something inherent about who you are. Um, and I think the other thing, um, well, I guess that just connects to like I was thinking about um, to what to what extent can you actually there, you know, Audrey Lord says you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And this is one of those things that I think about is like, I agree with that. And how can I use the master's tools to, to, to not dismantle marriage, but to dismantle other, other mm -hmm. systems of oppression? Um, because I do think that I have a lot of like, there's a lot of like psych psychological safety and all of these things that I get from marriage. And I hope that, that I use those to queer other things all over the place, I guess is kind of how I think about it. Mm -hmm. I like that term, queering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have so, to jump in for one second and say that, you know, um, the rights argument against our marriage rights was, was a lot based on just tradition, 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 right? And when when we would do the moots, you know, when you prepare someone for one of these arguments, there's numerous moots that they go through where the most difficult question that always, that we always just, I mean, there really was no good way to answer it, but what we would ask the question, uh, well, so why do you stop at changing the tradition of man and woman? What, why, why should it just be one, why should only one, person one or two people be able to participate in a marriage and, and we would just go on and on about it. It was like there was no good answer really. Um, I don't understand why. What well then okay. basically the yeah, argument we were okay. making was that the oh. it, that that the argument that tradition is why you should continue to limit marriage to just oh. a man and a woman is is not not supported by the law. And then the, the next question would be, well, so then what's to keep it to be just one person? There are two people who can who can get married, one person who can marry another. Why can't there be three people in America? Oh, I see. And we, we were trying to prepare, of course, for preparing the Supreme Court, you had to have a great argument for why. No, no, that's not what we're advocating for. You know, that, but what what was the reason? It was sort of like, well, tradition, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Like never really a very good answer. Okay. I, I have a son who's in his fifties, and the irony is he totally supports us. He'll introduce and say, These are my moms, not even saying which is biological or anything. But he does not believe in marriage for himself. Mm -hmm. I think he would be with you and you know, <laughs> whatever. It it just bothers me. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple more things to say. Yes, yeah. You last words. Okay. So I um when we did a celebration of life for Evelyn, um I um made pens for everybody. It says Evelyn Anderton, 1946 to 2023. And the other side is her favorite song, Give Yourself to Love. And as I was telling Martha, when I was ordering them, there was a price break. <laughs> and, and so I have a hundred pens extra. So if anybody would like a lovely pen, please come up and get one. Where's it? First I got you one. And the other thing is, I would like to read Justice Kennedy's opinion, a paragraph of it, because I, it, it meant a lot to me. But I want to interject first and say, a okay. proof that people can change. Justice Kennedy is who wrote the horrible opinion in the case mm -hmm. of, of the two men whose pictures I showed. 
So it was a five to four decision. Kennedy, Justices um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan joined him. Um, no union is more profound than marriage. Oh, oh. Um, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say that they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. Thank you. That's an excellent closing. Thank you for that. Come back in the back. Never mind. Come back in the on January 18th. I think that's the right date. And don't forget the pins. Don't forget the pins.